Yeah, I do have Phew. a couple questions. That's a relief. <laughs> yeah, I was doing a little bit of background research. Oh. Um, and when I was looking at other interviews you had done through like the CBS, not the CBS, CBS? the PBS oh, you one. you found the, the Caloris one. Yes. Um, I wanted to know like where does your creativity come from? Like because you have themes and you have narratives and you have metaphors, but. Where does it come from? Yeah. I, that's kind of a hard question now just because like, I don't know, I, meant, I mean, maybe if you ask that question of like someone who was at the end of their major league sports career and you ask them, so where does your athleticism come from? They'd be like, I don't know, it's just what I do. I've been doing it for a long time. But it must, I mean, it must come back to some early point of like, I think I had a lot of freedom as a kid just to kind of explore stuff. And that's probably where it lays in, in terms of it was okay to just go off on my own and walk in the woods across the street or just go off and read stuff or go off and go to the library or go off and draw stuff. So that probably set up the, I didn't have to worry so much about what someone was gonna think about what I was doing. And once you don't have that hanging over you, it's much easier just to be curious and try something and see what happens. And when you're a kid, you don't think about that. You're like, oh, what does this do? Um, and I think at this point, I've just been being curious and inquisitive and then making pictures about it long enough that it's not, it's just a thing. It's not a, I don't have to think about it. The only time I think about it is having to grapple with realizing that not everyone got to that point where they felt safe being curious and inquisitive, which, you know, it happens, you know, you've had a, whatever happened to you in your life that makes it so you're, that's not feeling safe to just try new things. Um, I've been lucky and not have to have that happen. So at this point though, it's like, you know, you start a ball rolling down a hill and it's a snowball and it just picks stuff up and after a while it's just gonna go rolling on whether or not you want it to anymore. Um, also what I learned when I was looking at your prints and previous work was you have a lot of symbols that continue to like occur, like the penguin. And then in this one I saw a lot of giraffes. Yeah. And I was wondering like, who is the giraffe character? Well, I suppose it is me. Like the penguin, I could claim, no, 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 that's not me. That's just me thinking about fatherhood because emperor penguins taking care of the, the males, taking care of the eggs. Um, and the giraffe started because I was using seahorses and penguins to the point that I was becoming the seahorse penguin guy and I didn't want to be so pigeonholed. Um, and the giraffe started because I just happened to be reading a book about a fiction, a novel that was about giraffes at the, uh, the Prague Zoo in Czechoslovakia in the 20th century. And there was lots of stuff about giraffe biology and how they see. Um, and so the vision thing, their giraffe vision kind of being like the way smell is for dogs. It's like, oh, that's a cool thing. I'm gonna think about that more. And um, having gone to the zoo in Albuquerque where I live a lot with my kids and seeing the giraffes there and thinking about that kind of graceful way they move. So I started drawing giraffes and then I suppose they probably did get to be kind of um, semi-autobiographical just because I'm tall and I make art, so there's a seeing thing, and it was a good way to do... Um, some of the other ones are the giraffe kind of being in roles I felt myself being as a high school librarian at that point in my life, and then it turned into a good... Um, that whole series of giraffe stuff on the wall here at the gallery that was more of a conscious trying to make a narrative with these two giraffe characters and one being male, one being female. And that was partly built on interaction with a friend I hadn't seen for a long time and then saw again and sort of comparing what we'd done with our lives since we were in college together. And that kind of made this sort of unfolding narrative of the transition from trying to figure stuff out when you're young to parenthood and adulthood and how things look with perspective looking backwards. Which again was the giraffe thing, like that kind of long vision, which getting to have that with age, I guess. I just came up with that just now. I hadn't thought of it that way before. Okay. So yeah, so that's the giraffes. It's just this kind of reflection, meditative, artist, artist totem kind of thing. Um, another one of your themes that I found was like the saints and how each of them had a different animal. Do you plan the animal before? Or do you plan the animal once it's done? You say, well, that saint reminds, like the imagery in that reminds was, me of this saint. It was both. 
um, depending on the saint, partly. The original saint idea had been kind of kicking around the back of my head for a while. Um, it popped up briefly seven or eight years ago. I did four archangels, and that was kind of accidental because I was drawing the penguin with like knight's armor on, and then went, oh, this could be a Saint Michael. And then I turned that into, and then I could do a Raphael and a um, Gabriel and a, a Uriel, and the animals were kind of tied to those elemental associations to each, arch each archangel, fire and earth and water and air, so that kind of led to the animals somewhat. Um, but then the more recent series, the original germination of it was thinking about St. Sebastian who gets martyred being shot full of arrows. And I don't remember when I first, this, you know, they just pop in your head, the ideas. And so this idea of a porcupine with it being like the arrows kind of being turned around. Um, and so this porcupine as St. Sebastian had been floating around in my head for a long time until I had the opportunity to do the whole series. So that was the, the animal coming first and knowing ahead of the, top, ahead of the game what I was gonna do. And the other extreme is probably um, one of the pieces of St. Francis who I did not intend to do at all. I wanted to not do really famous saints because there's already so much. I didn't wanna have to push back or wrestle with the like kind of established iconography of really famous saints. So St. Francis was kind of off the table. But a friend of mine knew I was doing this project and she raises llamas and said, oh, you should do St. Francis as a llama. That'd be, that'd be really cool. And I said, no, I'm not doing St. Francis. I don't want to touch that. Um, but she kept pushing the issue and was like, no, it's, it's perfect because they're like a shepherd and a sheep at the same time. And it's just, you can come and draw mine and use them. It's going to be, it'd be great. And I still was reluctant to do it. But and I went in a bookstore and happened on a new book about St. Francis by a local Albuquerque priest. I went, fine, I'll do St. Francis. Um, so that one was kind of picked for me by outside forces, and I wasn't even going to do the saint. It was, and it turned out to work really well. She was right. Um, and now there's the fun thing of people seeing that one and going, I, I don't recall what the St. Francis Lama connection is. Can you tell me? And me having to go, well, there isn't. I mean, there wasn't. Now there is. I invented it. Um, and then in between, it's kind of, it is, most of them were, um, well, this comes off sounding like some kind of dippy mystical process. Which saint I was doing next would kind of, I don't know, manifest or whatever. Like I'd come across something and it'd be interesting. And um, like the whale one, St. Brendan, I just happened on a reference and then read more about him being this guy that allegedly sailed all over the North Sea and the Irish Sea on this kind of Odysseus-like quest for this mystical island. And, and then there's a story of him preaching to fish because that was the available audience wherever he was at that time. And so it's just was really grabbed by that story. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do St. Brendan. And then thinking about at that point what animal would make sense. And that was an easy one in terms of having a whale because they are, they're epic, they're big, they travel the, um, the same regions that he was at. So that one came together nicely. Um, other ones like St. Teresa, Teresa de Avila, I knew what I wanted the image to be with a labyrinth as this kind of metaphor for a spiritual journey, but I, and I knew where the animal was going to go, but it took a really long time to figure out what you know, what to put, who to have her be, and end up being an owl mostly because of talking to um, a friend of mine whose father had a strong lay Jesuit background and knew a lot about her writing, and she came up with the owl idea. So, so it's not, there's semi intentional, semi random. Yeah, it seems like you get some outside influence too. That yeah. Yeah, and that's the evolving process of it, which that whole series was fun because it was more of a conscious, intentional kind of meditation, reflection, you know, be open to the spirit kind of thing as it goes, having this central focus, but then not being sure where it was going to come out. Also, I noticed the colors and how every plate has a different tone, or you laid to ground, and it seemed like there's almost multiple plates in there. Yes. Like, there can you multiple. explain your process a little bit on like technique and if? you use um, 
certain like aqua tint and that kind of stuff? Yeah, they're, um, they're all, all the color ones are multiple plate and I've been doing color stuff pretty much exclusively for at least 10 years now. I used to do more black and white and that's more that, that classic etching look going back to like Rembrandt. Um, but once I got sort of the knack down of the planning part of the color plates, it opens up a lot more potential for both the creativity and then also what you can depict once you can put color into the mix. So usually the process is, um, there's, well, there's my sketchbook, which has a bunch of just kind of quick ideas that as they appear to me, jot them down. And then um, if I'm gonna make a new thing, there's usually one where I go, oh, this would be an interesting image to pursue. And the hard part from that point is turning what was a quick sketch into like a working composition that makes sense and has and fits together and the design elements flow. Um, and that's still just all on paper. And it's not really the details of the image as much as the layout. And then that gets transferred with carbon paper onto a coated etching plate with just the, you know, the the general image, not all the details of like the leaves on the trees or the feathers on the bird or whatever. And then I have to draw on the coated plate and then a lot gets added in that process. Like it's sort of making it up as I go along, but within this structure I've already set up of there's gonna be this animal here and this figure here and this context. Um, and it used to be that I mostly finished that plate, mostly a line etching, uh, might use some aqua tint to add some tone, and then I would create a second or third plate offsetting the image onto some new plates, and then the color was mostly background textures, you know, knowing I want some color here and some color there. And then after I started to etch the plate, um, starting to work out the colors, and there's a back and forth of proof it where it is so far, try a few colors out, go back, etch some more, proof it again with some more colors, kind of get a sense of what I'm trying to do. And then eventually it turns into two or three plates and it's a finished image with this trail of proofs along the way. And now I've been doing it long enough that the color plates are part of more of the initial process. I can think more about when I'm making that first key plate, where to not draw things because it makes more sense to have it be on a color plate. And so there's this more of this interlocking jigsaw puzzle dance of this analytical part and this creative part and trying to not lose sight of what I was trying to do in the first place while at the same time trying to let the final thing unfold without being too obsessive about what I thought I was doing at the beginning. I noticed that on most of your plates are going on like a journey or you have the giraffe looking through a telescope for lost things like St. Anthony uh -huh. or you've got um, animals in a boat or like the bird, the, you know, the penguin coming down from the rocket ship. Yeah. Like on that, like, are you like trying to like depict going on a journey or journey you've been on or just the journey of art in general? I don't know. I don't totally know. It's some combination of, um, I have ended up living very far from where I started. I mean, still in the US, but going from Chicago to New Mexico is when I first moved to New Mexico, that felt like I've gone as far from Chicago as I can without leaving the United States just because it's such a different place to be in the desert instead of the Midwest and culturally. Um, and I lived here in Denver in between those two, but Denver and Chicago are not, you know, that, that different. There's the mountains and all that, but really culturally, architecture, it's not, you're still kind of arguably in the Midwest. So there's that kind of having unmoored myself from where I grew up kind of leaves, I mean, that gives a different perspective, I guess, to being in a place, being in a place because you're from that place as opposed to being in a place because you came there. Um, I think that probably fed into the journey thing a lot in terms of, okay, I've left home, where am I going? And have I found the new home or am I still en route to wherever I'm going? And there is probably an artist process thing, that whole like, I don't necessarily know where I'm going when I start the piece, even now when I know pretty well what I'm doing in terms of how to make it all come together. Um, and also I think the final, the journey piece, there is more of a conscious, you head out on a journey, you don't have to know where you're going. And that's coming back to that earlier curiosity thing. 
and I, I still, and I have off and on, and still I'm now a high school teacher, and so working with teenagers, I really think about the, some kids have an easier time learning new stuff because they have this curiosity and they're okay with like, okay, I'm not sure where this is ending up, but I'll follow this thread and learn stuff. And for other kids, that's scary. It, it, they want the certainty of like, I wanna know where I'm going before I head out. And, and that happens with, I mean, people of all ages do that. It's just easier to tell with teenagers because they don't like cover it up as much as a grown up would do. And the boats part are funny because I didn't start drawing boats until I moved to a place where there wasn't much water. Like, there were no boats when I lived even here, let alone in Chicago. It's only been since I moved to Albuquerque, which is 20 years now, but that's the boats, this boat and water obsession mm -hmm. all happened, I think, out of living a place where there's, you really think about, you notice water a lot and you really think about water more when you're living in a place where there's not a lot of water. Your artwork also is very playful. Um, has it always been playful? And I don't know, like you said that you like teach in high school and like kids and teenagers have like the best ideas and curiosity, but is that why your artwork is so playful? Or? It, prob it, it must be, because I know, I mean, I mean, a lot of people are angry when they're younger, but definitely the early art was much more like, rend, tear. Um, and somewhere along the line, the switching from the black and white to the color, and I think also, I mean, earlier making art in hindsight was maybe like a therapeutic thing, working stuff out, and that was happening at the same time I was being an elementary teacher, or even before that, taking care of other people's kids, just, you know, job-wise when I was in school, babysitting and all that. And then elementary teacher in middle school and high school and having my own kids. And it's hard because you live on the planet for a while and it's, you know, lots of stuff happens where you see awful things and it's hard to kind of stay open. Um, but it feels like it's been better to push back against that and try to be playful at, about things and that's I guess that's the main thing these things have been about, is trying to play and explore and be curious and see what happens so that I don't forget to go on doing that in everyday life. So after this show and these pieces, will there be more of the playful art? Or do you think that, like, where do you see it going in your direction? And Yeah, this? that is a good question, because I don't know. I finished these saints. Um, almost a year ago now and at that point I'd hit this kind of I have been doing etching pretty intensively and exclusively over any other art form at that point for eight years like you know a lot of the time and for about 18 years some of the time and even longer than that going back to when I was in um, you know in college in art school and I hit this point of I need to I, I like I need a break from thinking about copper plates and how the different plates mesh together and planning things in terms of, I'm gonna print an edition of 30, so is this idea feasible if I have to print it 30 times? And having people buying my art, having, you know, then that creates this, well, is anyone gonna to wanna to buy this? And that's a good thing to think about, but also it started being a limiting factor. Um, so I've kind of been on this break where my main creative outlet has been teaching high school math. Um, which does not feel like art at all. Well, doesn't sound like it's art at all. My wife insists that I am approaching it the same way I approach the etchings. And it is definitely engaging me the same way. And at some point, I'll have had this break from printmaking or from making art and it's gonna percolate back up again. And I assume there'll be a lot of trigonometry and geometry and algebra in whatever I make next. And that'll probably still involve printmaking but I want it to, I need to wait and see how that's gonna look in a different way, combining that with other things or finding out a way to make it more interactive with other people, I don't know. You can, exp you can try to be curious figuring out drawing a picture or you can try to be curious trying to figure out a complicated math problem. It's still practice and being curious and inquisitive and not being sure where you're gonna come out with in terms of an answer.